One and the FIA have a major problem on their hands, and it's to do with their main source of new drivers. Turns out it's not because of their constant conquest for more American money, it's to do with Formula 2. I don't think it's nearly as relevant as the organisers of it think it is. Let me assure you folks, this is in no way cheapening the efforts of the individual teams or the drivers. They have earned their right to have a shot of being in Formula 1. They are most definitely the stars of tomorrow. Whenever you get to watch some Formula 2 races, there are tremendous scraps for various positions up and down the grid. And it's a series that can make sprint races work. Why can't Formula 1 just do what Formula 2 does? Seriously, it's so much easier, so much cooler. And this goes all the way back to when it was known as GP2 from back in the mid 2000s. It in isolation is quite a lot of fun, but it's slowly beginning to lose more and more relevancy and efficacy of bringing Formula 2 drivers into Formula 1, which is its main purpose. In the last five seasons, only one of its champions has gotten into Formula 1 immediately because of his name. I will admit. The rest of them had roundabout ways of getting in or didn't get in at all. This is a far cry from 2018 where the top three got in immediately. That being George Russell, Lando Norris and Alex Albon. And then of course Charles Leclerc did so the year before. So why has it become incredibly difficult for anyone to even get a chance of being in Formula 1? The car. It's simply no good. Yes, I know it's being replaced next year, but we'll get to that. Since 2005, the series has not exactly been evolving its cars at a regular rate or even a decent rate. Of course, it's a spec series, and you can't expect the chassis makers and the organizers to come up with a brand new car every single year. They don't need to do that. If you kept changing the car every year, costs would spiral as everything would have to be replaced and you'd have to be making constant outlay. So I get that. There has to be a certain happy medium or a content clairvoyant. It costs about 3 million euros a season to take part. and. That's a lot for a guy not even out of his teens to source, so constantly changing the car, yeah, it's just not sustainable. In nearly 20 years of competition, there have only been five spec bumps. Five of them! Only three since 2011. Formula 2's current car has been around since 2018 and was brought in to more closely match the F1 cars, who themselves had a major regulation change back in 2017, which is fine and dandy. But then Formula 1 had another regulation change in 2019, then 2021, then 2022, as we all know, and Formula 2 fell way behind. Six years later, the car in F2 is still the same as back when Max Verstappen was a relative rookie in Formula 1. And that sport's become a completely different product with a whole different philosophy of generating downforce and driving style required to compete well, which F2 simply cannot replicate. It worked well back in 2018. That's why we saw four drivers in two seasons get into the sport and are still here. But now it's just no longer relevant in that sense in preparing new drivers to get into Formula 1. The car is a seriously bad example of what to expect. That and the engine is notoriously unreliable, produced by the same people that brought Williams back down to earth with a bump in 1918. Which is a shame really because that name is just so gosh darn cool. Mechachrome. Ooh. Nice. Yes, the reason why we are in this situation, why the F2 cars are just so slow and irrelevant these days, is down to world events because the original intention by the organizers of F2 and F3 was to have a three year cycle. So every three seasons or so, they would either innovate the cars a little bit to bring them up to date or completely change them. But due to cost concerns and trying to ease the burden of various teams and drivers, they basically just kept the cars the way they were. Much like how Formula One did so in 2020, because the 2021 cars could not be completely new models. That's why for the Red Bull car, it was the RB16B. But this has led to an unwanted side effect. F2 has lost media attention to other growing disciplines, most likely brought on by the current period of domination in Formula One also. Before you say anything, happens all the time in Formula One. It's just part of the series DNA. It just so happens to be probably for a lot of new fans the first time they've experienced it. And not my first time. The likes of Super Formula, World Endurance and IndyCar are gaining more and more interest amongst the motorsport community's more casual demographics and opening their eyes to other types of motorsport for those who've only watched Formula One. I think the devotees of these disciplines who have been watching these for years might be quite happy at all of this new attention and added interest. Or they might be discouraged at the amount of casuals not really knowing what they are doing. Let me know down in the comments if you've been watching these disciplines for many years and what you think about this new influx of interest. But wait, I hear you say. Didn't IndyCar have a bit of a sluggish period in 2018 and that's been the same chassis effectively, save for the aero screen since? 
Well, that's very true, and you can easily chalk that up to, of course, the Rona. But there were little tweaks in 2020, and in 2023 they've had a big change, which includes, amongst other things, much better improvements when it comes to wet weather racing. Did I say racing? Just wet, wet weather racing, sorry. Racing. But prior to 2018, since 2012, we got the ideal three-year cycle happening. Also, IndyCar can kind of get away with it because it's also a spec series and it's one of the premier motorsports in the US, certainly for single-seaters. So it's the pinnacle. You don't really need to go any higher because a lot of IndyCar drivers just stay there for a long time. They never really think that it's possible to get into Formula One. And it is certainly doable because if you do win the IndyCar series, you do get 40 super license points which is the exact amount needed to get into formula one which is why we are now starting to see a little bit more interest happening probably down to the likes of mclaren for example and callum eilot from 2020 going to indycar and then of course roman grosjean going to indycar for 2021 and then going to andretti and then promptly leaving Andretti. So maybe not all the best type. McLaren as well. You can easily chalk up a lot of the casual interest in IndyCar down to what McLaren have been doing. Zach Brown's interest in that sport has been really, really fascinating. And McLaren's increasing involvement in that sport and connecting it with its Formula One operations, its Formula E operations now, and Extreme E. And now, because of WEC, we'll get to that in a moment, they're getting back into GT racing. So is there anything that McLaren isn't doing right now? Are they spreading themselves too thin? Well, Zach Brown's enthusiasm for IndyCar has certainly given it a shot in the arm now because we've got Pato Award being a viable reserve driver for McLaren in 2024 and doing some young driver tests and proving to be quite competent. And then, of course, there's the Alex Pelot debacle, which has now given McLaren a two for two in terms of successful contract negotiations, because it looks like Alex Pelot might have to pay 1.3 Daniel Ricardos in compensation for a breach of contract, which he willingly accepted that, yeah, he did breach the contract because he wanted to stay in Indy which kind of makes Indy all the more interesting. You know, all publicity is good publicity. Then of course there's WEC and Super Formula. WEC had been relatively sedate in its media presence because not much was going on for a long time, being quite tricky to find also easy coverage for it. But that's been greatly improved over the last couple of years. Their social media has been increasing drastically. And then on top of that, they have had a major rejigging in terms of the specifications and the categories and the classes of racing, including the introduction of the hypercar. That has been a massive boost in interest because major manufacturers are now coming into the sport, with Ferrari being one of the biggest ones out there, returning after decades of just mainly doing GT stuff. With Antonio Giovinazzi's redemption arc last year at Le Mans, more people are looking at that sport and going, ooh, that's really nice. I mean, I quite like watching Le Mans every single year, but I'm seeing more and more eyes on it and more and more interest. And it's nice to see Antonio Giovinazzi do well after his mediocre time in Formula One and then his wet fart of an ending for Haas at Austin last year. And let's not forget that Indy had a redemption arc for Marcus Ericsson, him winning the Indy 500. So sometimes it goes to show that just because a driver bows out of Formula One in a not so gracious fashion, doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad driver. It's just they may be suited a different category. And one thing I think Wex got over F1 is because they have the track safari. I love that idea that an existing or former driver of the sport takes you around on a bus during a practice session and go, oh, if you look over there, that's that driver. They're doing that. That just looks so much fun. All of these other categories, they are also more accessible to fans. They are so much cheaper to get tickets for. There's a lot more interaction with the drivers. They don't seem really pushed away, but mind you, Formula One can't help that because these drivers are at the top and there's a lot of media publicity, so you can't really expect them to do everything. At least you're not paying up the wazoo just to even get in. And now I think Super Formula's had its time to shine as well. People were mildly aware of Super Formula, but for the longest time, it was seen as the place where motorsport careers went to die, unless you were Japanese, of course. But now that's completely changed, and that's thanks to Red Bull and Liam Lawson. Initially, people were thinking, oh no, they've condemned Liam Lawson to Super... Oh, okay, no, he's doing really well. And for the Break F1 channel, Liam Lawson was being interviewed, and he said that 
His involvement in Super Formula, the way the car is working right now, its current spec, was vital for him to learn the tricks of the trade and get used to Formula 1 and hit the ground running and do as well as he did. The car is seemingly proving to be very competitive and closer to F1 cars in some conditions than the outgoing F2 chassis. I also find it very funny that the F2 car for 2024 looks very much identical to a Super Formula car. But then you must remember that that chassis, the Super Formula 1, is produced by Dallara, who makes the F2 chassis. They probably just copy pasted it, did a couple of other tweaks, and then went down the pub. And about time too, because we really need this changing car. Because at the moment, we are seeing so many talented drivers not getting a chance in Formula 1 and having to look at different categories to try and get some more experience, some more super license points, or just not go stale just waiting on the sidelines being given a reserve driver role, which practically means nothing these days, other than just being wheeled out for publicity events when one of the main drivers can't be bothered to show up. De Vries took four years to get into a full-time seat to then be booted out. Oscar Piastri had a year out and only got into F1 at all because Alpine dropped the ball. And McLaren, seriously, these guys are just everywhere these days, were hyping him up to no end, blowing smoke up his bottom. And Felipe Dragovic? Well, Aston Martin's called dibs on him. Uh, given that Alonso is there for the foreseeable future, as is Lance Stroll, who has suddenly decided to be good again. I don't really see much hope in Dragovic getting in unless there's some kind of last minute deal in giving him to Williams on loan or something. We need a Brazilian on the grid, we really do. Maybe Bortoleto, perhaps, the F3 champion. The thing that F2 has going for it is that it's so easy to get points because the FIA and Formula 1 want you to go to Formula 2 because the top three, they all get the same amount of points, 40. No other category gives you that. IndyCar does give you the full 40 if you win, Super Formula gives you 25, and WEC, the champion drivers there, you get 30, which is a pretty good amount, but you can't just get into Formula 1 in one season in those categories. And uh, F in the chat for IMSA, you only get 18. But what does it matter, these points, if you can't get in in the first place? Then there's the drivers who are currently in Formula 1. They're not going away fast enough, are they? Because back in the day, I remember when Jean Alesi retired, he had been in the sport for 13 years, he had done over 200 Grand Prix, and I remember thinking, wow, that's a long time in Formula 1. 13 years? Crikey. He had a good innings, didn't he? But now, getting to over a decade in Formula 1 is becoming all the more commonplace. Max Verstappen is not that far off, he's been around for nearly a decade, Lando Norris is approaching five years in the sport and isn't looking to retire anytime soon. The idea of a Formula 1 driver retiring at 35 used to be quite common, but now, 35? That's not old at all. 40? That's looking relatively sustainable, because Lewis Hamilton's nearly there, Fernando Alonso's way past that. I wouldn't be surprised if he's nearly 50 and still in Formula 1, so long as he wants to be there. That's the thing. All of these drivers are staying on for much longer than they used to. And that's clogging things up for the junior drivers. Now, I'm not being ageist or anything like that. If they still have the drive to be in Formula One, then fair enough. It's still limiting because we're not back in the days in the 90s or the 2000s where you have 11, 12, 13 teams. And in the days of pre-qualifying, you could have maybe 15 teams. You could maybe have a chance of getting into qualifying if you're lucky. But... We've only got 20 seats and we're really struggling to fill them with new talent because maybe because of the merchandise ability and the publicity that all of these F1 drivers have, teams are less reluctant to get rid of them. And this limit in terms of space also might mean that F1 teams are simply not wanting to take risks on young drivers who aren't really as effective like we've seen with Logan Sargent. But then you've got Oscar Piastri, who completely justifies the F2 system, because look at his rookie year. But that wasn't a guarantee, because he didn't get that seat for 2022 at Alpine. He had to wait for McLaren to bail him out. And Piastri is now proven to be the most compelling rookie since Charles Leclerc. So what does that mean for F2 drivers currently? They're looking up at the top and going like, well, how am I going to get up there? They're all now resorting to looking at other categories to try and figure out what they're going to do with their time. Are they going to jump at the first opportunity of getting a reserve driver role? Now we've had some really bad examples of just getting it and then you're spending eternity in F1 limbo? No, drivers don't want to do that. They want to race. So go to IndyCar because there's more appetite for it. Go to World Endurance because the hypercars look really cool as well as the other classes, even doing some classic GT, that'd be nice. And then Super Formula, that's now getting some more interest and recognition. And what I find really curious is that 
some of these Super Formula drivers are coming to F2. Ritomo Miyata, the current Super Formula champion, the one who just pipped Liam Lawson, is coming to F2 for 2024 with Carlin, with a car that is made by the same people that make the Super Formula chassis and looks practically similar. I think he might have an advantage when you get to the preseason test. Watch out for him. So with this brand new car, the 2024 F2 champion might have a better time of it in getting a seat in Formula One. But they might not. There's that ambiguity, which is sort of making Formula 2 less of an interesting option to catch up on when you've got the likes of WEC, IndyCar, Super Formula, even Formula E in a way. There's just so many more things to watch and Formula 2 is looking more and more like a dead end. And I really don't want that to be the case because the point is, it's meant to showcase the stars of tomorrow. Well, tomorrow may never come for some of them. In fact, maybe all of them. So look to other places, which is what sometimes some ex-F1 drivers are doing. Much like with Mick Schumacher going to Alpine's World Endurance campaign for 2024. Watch this video next to watch my theory about how this could mean he could get back into Formula One with Alpine.